at a broader level, the guild is focused on a few things. Um, one is to help engineers engage with each other to help them grow through engagements like this, where, for example, we have experts like like Joe come in and talk about their um, matter expertise. And, and then the third aspect of it is where we provide access to a whole variety of sort of, I would say, some traditional, but also a lot of non-traditional uh, revenue streams. And I can get into that uh, one-on-one at some point. If, if folks are, are interested, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or email and I can discuss that. But at a high level, the guild is divided into various different bands. We have five bands starting from Apprentice, where it's basically engineers with very limited experience, maybe starting off with some even boot camp experience, um, all the way through to gurus, where people truly are subject matter experts in their chosen area of expertise um, and, and a few levels in between. Most people that in the mastermind stand the, at the expert or the guru level, though we have occasionally brought in speakers that that uh, from within our guild at, at the coder level, for example. In terms of uh, where the engineers are located, they're really all over the world. Just skip past this and go to the engineering mastermind series in particular. If you can, if you want to listen to any of our future or uh, mastermind events or where you want to track that, you can track that off of our company page on LinkedIn. You can also track that of of archimedes.dev slash both act. I can share that URL in the comments of uh, of this event later. But yeah, this is a monthly mastermind series that occurs on the first Wednesday of every month starting at, it's a set time every month. It's at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern, 9, 9 a.m. Pacific, 9.30 IST, GMT. That allows us to cover most of the world. If we try to do it at any other time, we end up missing, you know, so I mean, we still do, we still end up missing a lot of the Asia Pacific and Australia time zones, but this is kind of the best we can do with, with the bulk of the audience that we generally have. That said, I'm going to cut my part of it right here because the, the whole purpose of this talk is to get into, into Joel's part of the presentation. So I'll stop sharing and Joe, I'll let you introduce yourself and then go through your deck. But at a very high level, the one thing I would like to say is by Joel's one of the best speakers we've had in mind up to this point. And I was very excited by the talk he gave last time, which you can find the full video of um, in comments of the event. But if if you if you're not able to find it, please let me know and I can share it. But it was very popular both here as well. YouTube on that event and need to need need to um, ask questions and we can probably direct those questions as well. With that, I'll hand it over to Joe and Joel and thank you again for being here today. Got to find that unmute button. Thank you so much, Sadiq. Uh, yeah, uh, excited to be here. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time out of your day to uh, to come listen to me talk about this topic. It's something that I'm pretty passionate about, uh, and now I'm actually working in the industry, so even more knowledgeable than I was before. Uh, so uh, so excited to, to share some of this with you. Uh, before I start, let me paste something into the chat here. It's a link to the uh, project that we're going to sort of try to build from scratch towards the end of this session. Uh, and there are some prerequisites in there. If you want to get started on installing those prerequisites, there's like four commands to run. So if you don't already have Rust and a couple other tools that are mentioned uh, in that link, uh, you can follow along with me. Uh, don't feel to do so, though. Um, you know, I'm going to go through it pretty fast. So it you know, cut and paste in some code. So might not be a practice to keep up anyway. Uh, but that link that is there all also, in case you want to uh, take a look at the completed project and, uh, you know, on your own time later on. So that's that. Let me go ahead and share my screen and I will myself. Uh, all right. So uh, let's see. Let me minimize this. I don't know if you can see that overlay, but we want that out of the way. All right, so the topic today is WebAssembly, uh, where it's at today, the things you can do with it, and what's coming down the pipeline uh, in terms of new features and new contexts in which WebAssembly can run. Uh, if, you're, if you've heard of WebAssembly already, you've probably heard of it in the context of um, uh, web browser-based applications, essentially running native code in the user as opposed to JavaScript, which of course was the original way you added dynamic dynamic content uh, and sort of reactive uh, types of content uh, to a web, web application. Um, uh, WebAssembly, uh, well, we'll get into the history in a moment here. So uh, to start with, uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I've been a software engineer for a little over 20 years now. 
uh, mostly working in real-time communications. Uh, we're using Zoom here. We've got a LinkedIn stream going, those sorts of things, audio codecs, video codecs, minimizing latency, uh, ensuring robustness. Uh, a lot of that uh, involved distributed systems, um, which is you know kind of part of everyday backend development these days. <clears throat> Back in the early 2000s, uh, it was a lot less mature. We didn't have Kubernetes. We sort of invented stuff like that in in-house uh, and uh, and sort of built our tools from scratch. Uh, so it's actually kind of an exciting time now to have some of these off-the-shelf tools help us build these systems uh, much more quickly. Uh, also been involved in compilers. I wrote a Java virtual machine back in the day for various reasons I won't go into, into now, uh, but that involves some pretty low-level system type of programming, and that's always been a passion for me. Uh, programming language theory in general is just, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a nerd about that kind of thing. Uh, so if anybody wants to chat about that, uh, you know, later, uh, feel free to, to shoot questions my way. Um, and uh, so for the most of my career, uh, it's been mostly focused on Java and C++, uh, but for the, for the past five or six years or so, uh, been mostly focused on Rust. Uh, it turns out to be just a really good tool for the types of things I work on. Uh, and as of about nine months ago, I started uh, as a principal engineer at a company called Fermion Technologies, where I'm working on uh, WebAssembly uh, language support. So support for you know running Python and web WebAssembly, running Ruby and WebAssembly, running JavaScript, uh, Java, all you know, you name it. Uh, trying to improve the tools that will allow you to do that. Uh, and then also working on some technologies called WASI and the component model, which if you don't know what those are, that's okay. We're going to talk about that today. And then I included a link to my GitHub. Uh, pretty much most of the work, as I was telling Sadiq, uh, that I do for Fermion is open source. Uh, so if you're curious about the details there, you can check out uh, check out GitHub. And by the way, feel free to interject if you have any questions throughout this. Uh, you know, I like to keep it pretty casual uh, and happy to go into more detail if uh, something's not clear or you just want more info. info. Uh, so the agenda today, we're going to start with kind of the what what WebAssembly is and why you might want to use it uh, and also why you might not want to use it. Uh, and we'll look briefly at the history of WebAssembly, uh, how we got to where we are today, uh, then look at the current status, uh, what you can and can't do with WebAssembly, uh, and uh, most, most relevantly today uh, for where I'm at uh, in my career, and also said Sadiq was interested in this, uh, beyond the browser, basically, you know, WebAssembly was originally intended to run native code in the browser, uh, achieve high performance. Uh, uh, for web applications in the browser, and it's still really good at that. Uh, but it turns out that some of the reasons why it's so great at that make it a tool uh, outside the browser as well. And we'll look at some use cases uh, and some of the technologies to support those use cases. Uh, and then we'll look at some of the uh, future developments that are coming down the pipeline uh, in the form of in-progress proposals, which are either in the design stage or the implementation stage, or a little of both, as it, as it turns out. Uh, some of these non-browser use cases a little bit better. Uh, and then finally, we'll do a bit of a workshop uh, where we'll build an application from scratch that uses WebAssembly both, both in the cloud and in the browser uh, simultaneously. So what is WebAssembly? Uh, it's really two things. It's it could be, uh, depending on how you you know you you uh, you divide it up. Uh, one is that it's a platform and language agnostic executable format. So uh, we'll look at some alternatives out there, some pr uh, prior art, if you will, uh, where uh, th there have been technologies like the JVM and the .NET CLR, which were uh, so somewhat platform, were definitely platform agnostic, but somewhat language agnostic, but not as much as we would like, and and uh, not as much as uh, as WebAssembly aspires to be. Uh, and then it's also uh, perhaps even more importantly. It's a sandbox for running untrusted code securely and efficiently. Uh, and there are other uh, technologies out there for isolating uh, and, uh, and sandboxing untrusted code, but they may not be as secure or efficient or both uh, as WebAssembly was designed to be. 
so why would you be interested in WebAssembly as a developer or someone who's doing you know, architecture for, for a new product? Uh, one reason is near native execution speed uh, in co comparison to, say, in the browser using JavaScript, although JavaScript engines have evolved uh, to a, a, an astonishing degree uh, over the past years uh, and are extremely uh, performant. Uh, that performance is not always necessarily reliable and it can be difficult, especially going from browser to browser, from say Safari to Chrome, uh, to get consistent performance uh, in all the ways that you might want it. And WebAssembly tends to be a more predictable target for achieving uh, certain performance milestones. Uh, it's also highly portable. Uh, you know, the fact that it was originally intended for the browser and that all major modern browsers support it and have for quite a while. Um, uh, it's also available uh, as a, you know, a desktop target. Uh, you can run it on mobile, usually via a web browser, but also uh, in a standalone app that hosts a WebAssembly runtime. Uh, embedded scenarios have been increasingly interesting for a lot of companies where they want to be able to push out code to an Internet of Things device, say a uh, 5G um, uh, base station or uh, an automotive embedded uh, use case, push out these uh, updates without necessarily jeopardizing certain key features of, say, the underlying real-time OS. Uh, and one of the ways you can do that is via the sandbox model that WebAssembly provides. Uh, and speaking of the sandboxing, the, the, the uh, other reason you might choose it is that uh, fine-grained, efficient isolation. And here I'm kind of talking about, uh, especially in cloud computing, there's two types of isolation that we're really interested in. One is multi-tenant isolation. If you're running your code in a shared environment, such as AWS or GCP or Azure, uh, you're probably, uh, you know, table stakes for you is that your application is isolated from, say, your competitor's uh, application, which might be running on the same infrastructure uh, because you're both using AWS. And so whether deliberately or accidentally, you do not want uh, applications from multiple tenants to conflict with each other uh, in terms of resource usage or in terms of data access. Uh, and then there's another type of isolation that can be equally important depending on the domain, which is per user isolation. So uh, essentially the idea here is that you're handling incoming requests from multiple users. As much as possible, you want a defense in depth strategy such that user A's data uh, that they're you know, submitting or downloading uh, is in no way accessible to user B or user C, uh, and that also their resource usage uh, remains uh, you know, isolated from each other. So those two types of isolation, multi-tenant and multi-user isolation, equally important. And uh, the existing uh, systems out there, such as container-based runtimes and virtual machines, tend to be better at the coarse-grained isolation, multi-tenant type of isolation, but as we'll see, not necessarily as good at the fine-grained per-user isolation. Uh, and that's one of the places WebAssembly shines. Uh, okay, and then the, you know every every slide that says why you should use something should always be followed by why you shouldn't use something. In my opinion, uh, nothing, no technology is perfect for every use case. Uh, one of the big reasons why I would tend to uh, suggest people not use WebAssembly, even though I'm a big fan, is that there's still pieces that are under construction. If you your application relies on multi-threading, for example, in a shared memory context, uh, it's not there yet. There are experimental options out there, and there are workarounds you can use for various browsers, but it's not a first-class citizen yet. Uh, composition, basically composing, taking an off-the-shelf WebAssembly module and composing it with another WebAssembly module and having, say, a first-class package manager similar to, uh, you know, PIP or, you know, Cargo for Rust or, uh, you know, uh, Maven for, for Java, uh, you know, having something that for the whole WebAssembly e ecosystem is something that we aspire to create uh, but is not yet in place. Again, design and implementation work has begun, but it's not yet ready for, for, for prime time. 
Another reason why you might not want to choose it is depending on the programming language you want to use, uh, the targeting WebAssembly may be uh, super easy or it may be quite difficult. Uh, and this is improving every day. Uh, Go, for example, uh, uh, there, there's an alternative Go implementation called TinyGo, which has had WebAssembly uh, support for quite a while. And now upstream, uh, Go uh, now is uh, introducing support for it, uh, in particular in the form of WASI, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But there are other languages, uh, which uh, such as Java and .NET, which uh, were really sort of in the early stages of WebAssembly support, and uh, you have to be pretty adventurous to uh, to take that on. And then finally, performance is not ideal for some workloads. Uh, if you've got, if you're making use of uh, general purpose GPU types of computing, for example, or neural network, uh, you know, machine learning, uh, that is uh, right there yet. Uh, again, work is being done, but uh, it's only really for the adventurous and the experimental uh, uh, mindsets. Yeah. Uh, and this, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, you also talk about the fine grained uh, model, right? Like where right. Are the will be at the user level. Like how will be the resource consumption over there? Like will that be too much? So or... can you can you say that last part one more time? Uh, uh, let's say when we have a user level fine grained uh, mm -hmm. uh, separation there. Yeah. Like how impactful will that be for the resource consumption or uh, the performance wise for perform performance uh that's actually very apropos because this is the next slide i was i was going to talk about uh yeah th this this actually kind of gets right to it which is uh, if you know the native no web assembly no isolation whatsoever just calling of invoking a function uh and i actually i think i have a link here i'll try and get the link to the slides to you guys uh, via SADIC or, or you know, uh, some mechanism later on. But uh, I I've actually have some benchmarks that you can run and reproduce this data. So I didn't, I'm not just making this up. Uh, but th this is, uh, these are examples of going from no isolation whatsoever, just making a function call and, uh, and handling the result to uh, extremely coarse grain isolation via a state-of-the-art VM in the form of uh, Amazon's Firecracker. And so native isolation, you can Make this invocation for this particular function that I put together, which was not trivial, but pretty, pretty does very little work in reality. Uh, took about 150 nanoseconds on my Mac Mini. Uh, uh, Into uh, sort of fine grain isolation using WASM time, which is one of the state of the art WebAssembly runtimes out there, uh, introduces an 87x overhead. That's pretty bad. But to put this in context, that's 13 microseconds. That's faster than I can ping my uh, router, home router, over a wired internet connection from my laptop. So it's still pretty darn fast. It's you know less, than, well less than a blink of the eye. But if you're trying to pack as much uh, wor work into a given piece of hardware, you want that number as low as possible. The good news, as we'll uh, look at in a little bit later, is there is room to improve this, and we're going to get closer to maybe like even. Even a, a 2x or a 3x or maybe even a 1 point something x multiple and still retain those guarantees that per user fine grained isolation that we were hoping for uh, uh, based on some proposals out there to extend uh, the Intel arch and, and ARM architectures with some additional memory management uh, uh, capabilities. Um, but just to, but this slide is still this is this is what we have today. This is kind of the best we can achieve or have achieved anyway today using various technologies. We can see that WebAssembly gets uh, pretty far uh, along the line of performance, uh, certainly versus a container Docker-based uh, isolation strategy and uh, uh, and certainly versus a virtual machine type of thing. Um, and uh, th uh, th this this slide is kind of close to my heart because uh, we at Fermion are building a serverless platform and we are trying to make that as efficient as possible and uh, you know really compete with existing options out there such as AWS Lambda and uh, GCP functions and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, we see a lot of promise in Web WebAssembly. We think that's the way forward uh, for this fine grain isolation, but it's done without cost. Uh, to answer your question, uh, we're trying. We're just trying to bring those costs down. Is the main thing. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Oh. 
Thank you. Uh, let's see. Any uh, before I go, any other questions on that topic? All right. Uh, so uh, WebAssembly is cert first uh, approach to this sort of problems um, back in the 70s uh, or 80s. I'm not sure when Beam came out. I know Erlang was originally based on Jam, which was kind of the first Erlang implementation. And there was an evolution of that. Uh, but I believe that, you know, Erlang sort of came to the fore for telecommunications back in the 70s. Uh, so let's say that. So that was one of the earlier ones. There's a lot not listed here, uh, but there is Beam, which has a lot of interesting properties. And in some ways are, is very close to the heart of what WebAssembly is trying to achieve. For example, that fine grain isolation, Erlang was doing that, that you know, a long, for a long time, for many decades. Um, uh, the, the, some of the arguable drawbacks for Erlang for some applications is that it's more tied to an Erlang type of execution. Uh, so there's not that many languages that kind of fit that model, uh, Erlang and Elixir being, uh, being the, the prime examples that do. Um, and uh, it's also not really meant for multi-tenant types of applications. It's not it, this the type of isolation Erlang ensures still sort of assumes that the code is trusted. You wouldn't necessarily want to host untrusted code on in the same Beam VM as your your uh, as your trusted code. Um, uh, but but I'm not. I, I don't want to speak out of school there. I'm not an expert on Erlang, so you know th there may be uh, maybe some progress on that. It's just my understanding that that was not the original design goal. Um, then there's Java, JVM. If you're around in the 90s or the early 2000s, the, the uh, promise of Java was write once, run it everywhere. Uh, so the idea was that Java could run in the browser via applets. Java could run on the server via you know servlet containers. Java could run uh, on embedded devices. Still does on uh, you know on Android phones via Dalvik. Um, so there was Java, and there still is Java, uh, and it's a great choice. Although again targeting Java with languages that weren't really meant to fit the Java model, uh, such as, say, Kotlin and Scala and Clojure, uh, tends to not be a totally great fit. Uh, the other aspect that may or may not concern you is the fact that it's controlled by Oracle, uh, which you know uh, has its own goals for the platform, which may or may not be compatible with, with your individual goals as a, as a developer. Uh, similar story with .NET. Uh, you know, it's been around for a while now. Uh, very similar goals. Uh, you've got C sharp, you've got F sharp, you've got other languages that can target it. Uh, in some ways, .NET is actually uh, was was earlier to the game in terms of polyglot programming. But again, it still assumes a certain type of language that's garbage collected, that is in many ways dynamic, which uh, WebAssembly does not assume you're running. Uh, and then if you remember Flash, that was fun, Macromedia, and then Adobe, and then it got killed, and now it's really no more. Uh, but it was pretty cool at the time. Uh, you had an action script, and you had a, a pretty cool and performant VM, uh, and it was hot stuff uh, back in the day, but uh, not really an option now. Uh, ASM.js was the immediate predecessor for um, for WebAssembly. Not much use for it now that we actually have WebAssembly, but it is essentially uh, a subset of JavaScript designed for high performance. And uh, you can still target ASM.js, but most browsers that support ASM.js performantly now all support, support uh, WebAssembly. So you might as well just use WebAssembly. Uh, and then you may have heard uh, back in, say, uh, 2000s, 2010s uh, of NACL or native client and portable native client. Uh, they were Google initiatives to run actual native, say, x86 or ARM code in the browser, or in the case of portable native client, it was LLVM bit code. Uh, and again, that went by the wayside uh, when WebAssembly was introduced. <clears throat> And one technology that's definitely still going strong uh, and has a bright future is eBPF. Uh, and there's definitely some overlap 
with web between the goals of WebAssembly and eBPF. Uh, eBPF is more concerned with uh, running user space code in the kernel in a sandboxed environment without compromising the security or integrity of the kernel. Uh, but it does support Linux and, and I believe Windows now. Uh, so pretty cool technology. And I imagine people are trying to use it outside of the kernel oriented workflow. Uh, but uh, I haven't heard a lot about that uh, uh, at this point. So a quick history of WebAssembly. Um, it's fairly new technology compared to some of the others we just looked at. Uh, 2015 was the initial preview release, uh, supported with early support in some browsers. In 2017, the MVP was released and it was it got support in Safari, which was the last one uh, of the major browser vendors to, to adopt it. Or maybe it was Edge, I can't remember which was the last, but they, it both happened in 2017. Uh, and so now they all do support it, uh, including on mobile platforms. Platforms. In 2019, the core uh, instruction set architecture was standardized by the W3C. Uh, and then in 2022, uh, the 2.0 draft was released, which adds some nice features like symmetric uh, or so, sorry, single instruction, multiple data um, instructions, and multi value return, uh, which can be useful for, for certain languages that can return multiple values, such as Go or Rust. So that's that's a whirlwind tour of the history. Let's look at the current status. Uh, on the left, you see we have the core ISA, and uh, it's essentially a 32-bit ISA. So even if you're on a 64-bit platform, uh, the WebAssembly that you're running is almost certainly 32-bit uh, based on current browser and other runtime support. Uh, and then, as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, SIMD uh, is available. Uh, it's not uh, SIMD is not complete in the sense that there's probably there's more work to be done uh, for for portable uh, and performance SIMD, but the basics are there uh, to get you a nice speed up for certain parallel workloads. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff coming soon. It has some of this stuff has actually been coming soon for a, a few years. So don't hold your breath on some of it. Uh, the thing to understand is some a lot of the people who are working on this are, are very passionate, but there, it's also sort of a, a a, a part-time uh, and some in some cases volunteer effort. Uh, unlike Java or .NET, this is not WebAssembly is not driven by a single company uh, with you know as sort of a, a prestige project or something that's core to their business model. It tends to be sort of a a cool thing that's not central to any one company's business model, but is. Uh, interesting enough that they're willing to put resources behind it, but as a result, you know the the it can be subject to the budget constraints and timetables of uh, various companies working together on these things, and so some stuff kind of takes longer than one would like is the bottom line. In any case, what we do have coming is 64-bit memory access uh, for for you know workloads you know that require that. Multiple memories, multiple memories can be useful in terms of concurrent multitasking. If you say a module, and we'll talk about comp module composition later on, but a WebAssembly module might want to have its own private memory, but then also export a memory for other modules to use and share access to. Similar to what if you're familiar with lower lower level. Uh, 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 native processing in on say Windows or Unix platforms, being able to have both private memory and shared memory can be useful when co uh, collaborating across process boundaries. Uh, exception handling and garbage collection, basically the, the overall story here is better support for higher level and dynamic languages. Um, today, by all means, you can run a language that uses these things like exception handling and garbage collection in WebAssembly, but they have to bundle their own garbage collector and exception handling, unwinding, that sort of thing, uh, uh, technology or, or code, uh, which can bulk up the size of the module. And there is a desire to uh, build this into WebAssembly uh, at least, uh, and you could still, even once it's part of the WebAssembly runtime, you could bundle your own garbage collector if there are performance reasons specific to your language that uh, that make uh, make sense to do so. Uh, but the idea is that there would be something built in as a good default choice, uh, and that would also improve interop with JavaScript in the browser.
And then finally, multi-threading. Uh, some people are kind of shocked that multi-threading isn't already a thing. But again, if you consider the web roots, you know, multi-threading in the browser is still uh, somewhat uh, not uh, somewhat primitive uh, compared to what you might be used to as a native programmer or a Java programmer. Uh, but it is coming down the pike. Uh, it's, it's not oh, part yeah. of it, is it? Oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, the one more time. Exception handling is not available as of now, is it? Or is this some optimized exception handling that we're talking about? Yeah, it's uh, yeah. So you can do ex exception handling again today in WebAssembly on any WAS WASM runtime, but that sort of requires that the runtime do its own tracking in terms of being able to do uh, essentially normal stack unwinding in WebAssembly is just returning from a function, and so essentially to implement stack exception handling, you'd have to at each at each function call that might throw an exception, you need to check the return value to see if it threw an exception or returned normally. Uh, and, and WebAssembly isn't going to help you with any of that, if that sort of makes sense. And then also, if it threw an exception, deciding whether to propagate it or not. And so that, for most runtimes, that would involve maintaining tables uh, to kind of determine, OK, which exceptions does, does this call location actually catch versus which do they propagate upwards uh, uh, or downwards down the stack, depending on how you look at it. So, so yeah, so what's being proposed here and what is actually somewhat implementing, to be clear, uh, all the things on this coming soon list are actually implemented in some implementations. It's, it'll be hard to find a single implementation of WebAssembly that has all of them, though. Uh, and some of them are still uh, being uh, having some design tweaks, and so they're not necessarily standardized and stable yet. Uh, so, uh, But yeah, exception handling is an example of where there would be first class catch and throw uh, okay. instructions in the ISA that would handle that sort of thing. Oh, OK. Well, thank you. Sure. Yeah, great yeah. question. All right, so language support. Uh, so this is very opinionated. This isn't based on any objective criterion. This is just based on the past few years of playing around with these things. Um, and it's very much an incomplete list. There are a lot more languages like Haskell and you know uh, maybe less, uh, less popular languages, if you will. Um, out there that actually have excellent support for WebAssembly, but I figured these would be the most generally relevant for your average developer. Uh, the gold support, I would say maybe even platinum support is with Rust. Uh, it's probably the, your first choice. If you don't already have a plan to use a specific programming language and you're open to trying Rust, that's going to be the smoothest road towards WebAssembly. Um, uh, C and C++ was the original like uh, uh, language or, or a, a set of languages that were in mind for running native code in the web browser. And one of the original demos back in 2015 was a C++-based, Unity-based game uh, running in the browser using, I think, WebGL. Um, so C and C++, very good support there uh, if you like those languages. Uh, Swift, also quite good support, mainly because it's a compiled language. You'll, you'll see the pattern here. These tend to be compiled languages, languages that already compiled the native code and are easy enough to port to compile to, uh, uh, to uh, a, a relatively runtime light uh, environment like WebAssembly. Uh, there are a few others, assembly script, which is like TypeScript. Maybe you could think of it as a subset of TypeScript uh, designed to target WebAssembly from, from the scratch. Uh, and then Grain also was designed from scratch to target WebAssembly and is thus quite good at it, as you might imagine. Uh, the Silver support uh, JavaScript TypeScript. One of the uh, big challenges in WebAssembly that, uh, you know, for a language like JavaScript or TypeScript, where a lot of the performance traditionally has been through just in time compilation, WebAssembly doesn't really want you to do just in time compilation. And there, there are reasons having to do with the sandboxing and the security isolation. And essentially, especially in the cloud computing arena, you don't necessarily, you, you don't want to do, download and run code 
at runtime, uh, because then you know it's uh, there. Uh, from a security standpoint, you start to expose yourself to things like log for shell. If you're familiar with the log for j vulnerability that that uh, you know in the, in the past year or two, um, uh, there there are certain types of vulnerabilities that no longer become a concern if you don't load any code at runtime. And so the latest you would want to actually load code is at an in instantiation time when you're creating instantiating a module and calling into it for the first time. Uh, that's that's the latest you really want to load in any sort of dynamic code. Uh, and as a consequence, just-in-time compilation it doesn't really work. The good news is there are various initiatives to get most of that performance back uh, via the strategic ahead-of-time compilation, uh, but those have not yet matured to the point where they're usable. Uh, so uh, the performance bottleneck is particularly acute with JavaScript and TypeScript, unfortunately. Uh, Python is a bit of a different story because people are kind of used to Python not being the most performant. Uh, in other words, you tend to use uh, C uh, or Fortran code in the case of NumPy to do the, the heavy lifting from a performance standpoint and to just call in and out of that code from Python. Uh, so that's so performance isn't as much of a concern there. However, because Python's ecosystem relies so heavily on native code and it relies on maybe older technologies such as Fortran in some cases, um, mixing all that together in bundling it together in a way that Python makes sense for Python is a bit of a challenge. And we'll talk in a little bit about some initiatives to improve that. Uh, Ruby, similar story, performance, not a huge concern. Uh, but uh, but there is uh, you know compared to uh, JIT's base of very uh, just in time compilers be available for Ruby uh, there are potential concerns there. Uh, PHP uh, has uh, also you know similar story just in time compilation. Go uh, is ahead of time compiled and so will soon I think be on the gold list here. Uh, but it's still kind of early days. It was only just. Uh, uh, I adopted as an officially supported platform by Upstream Go. Uh, so we'll, I think we'll see that improve uh, dramatically over the next you know few months, uh, just not quite there yet. And then finally, bronze, um, there this seems to be a bit of an impedance mismatch between uh, the WebAssembly community and the Java and .NET communities, partly because I think there's a thinking that, hey, Java and .NET already have robust, mature runtime and environments, why would we try to target another one? Uh, and that is, in many cases, a very legitimate concern or, or, or uh, sort of counter argument. Uh, however, uh, you know, I'm, I'm biased here. I think there actually are some benefits, uh, especially in the Java arena, where uh, sandboxing was originally a goal of the platform, but has been gradually abandoned. Uh, I think uh, there could be renewed interest in sandboxing via WebAssembly for Java and JVM languages. Uh, but for now, and so all this is just to say, you can you can target uh, WebAssembly with these languages, but it's uh, it's it's a bit challenging, and it's certainly not an official thing uh, as of yet. Okay, so uh, like I said at the beginning, uh, WebAssembly was originally designed for web browsers, uh, and it's still a great fit for that. But some of the reasons why it's such a great fit for that actually make it a great fit for other contexts. Uh, and I've talked a lot about fine grain isolation, and it can be really useful. Uh, for example, if you've got a multi-user or multi-tenant database, and you want to run user-defined functions there, basically, aka stored procedures or custom aggregates, uh, being able to do that in web assembly is really convenient because uh, you can sandbox that uh, UDF so that it only has access to what that user's credentials say it should have access to in terms of data access. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, edge computing and Internet of Things, uh, it, it's got some appeal there to essentially separate your core real-time OS types of code from your uh, sort of maybe higher level code, uh, which can run in a sandbox and thus won't take down the whole system if it's got a bug in it, uh, you know, making for uh, quicker uh, sort of release cycles for those sorts of things. And then edge computing, the idea here is that 
uh, you, uh, you know, if you think of something like Cloudflare or Fastly, they're all about uh, moving the cloud computing closer, geographically speaking, to the the users of that uh, of that co compute, uh, and so doing sort of just right right at the edge. You know, if you if you're living in India, you want to actually have your code application code running, uh, you know, in a, on a, a server in India, uh, and, and and likewise for other locations. Uh, smart contracts uh, on the blockchain, WebAssembly is a logical choice. It was designed to be isolated, to be uh, statically verifiable um, and, uh, you know, uh, resource constrained. Uh, various WebAssembly runtimes have uh, what's called fuel or metrics to measure the amount of CPU and memory uh, and constrain those things uh, that, that an application is using, which is ideal when you're running arbitrary untrusted code. Uh, plugins, a uh, great example, uh, uh, you know, say a uh, photo editing application or uh, any uh, or uh, video games, you know, uh, uh, electronic games are a great example of where plugins can be really useful, where you you want to uh, cultivate a thriving ecosystem of third party developers to kind of make your platform more valuable. Having plugins that are isolated, but can, that can provide value and, uh, you know, uh, uh, magnify the value of your platform uh, can be really powerful. Uh, without, uh, you know, uh, uh, essentially making your your platform vulnerable to certain types of attacks. Uh, close to my heart uh, at Fermion is uh, serverless and functions as a service. Uh, we talked about fine grain isolation there, being able to uh, spin up a virtual machine uh, for all intents and purposes uh, to run a very quick short lived request and then shut it down so that it's not using any resources except when it's running is ideal. That's why uh, Amazon developed Firecracker. Uh, as, as we saw on a previous slide, WebAssembly has the potential to make a huge uh, improvement in terms of the uh, hardware utilization uh, uh, there, which you know has dividends in terms of economics and environmental uh, concerns and so on. And then finally, dependency isolation. Uh, this is one that I always come back to. Uh, supply chain security it tends to be top of mind for pretty much any software developer these days. Various, it's there are very you know WebAssembly is by no means a panacea for that, but it's an exciting piece of the puzzle uh, for improving dependency isolation. The idea, and we'll we'll talk about this in a little bit more uh, later. The idea here is that you would be able to adopt a dependency and restrict on a fine grained basis what that dependency has access to. So that if your application as a whole may have access to the network, to the file system, to sensitive user information, passwords, et cetera, you can use WebAssembly to isolate a dependency so that it has access to exactly what you give it access to and no more than that. Uh, for example, if you want it to uh, base 64 encode something, well, then it should have access really to only the thing you're ask, asking, asking it to encode and nothing else. And uh, WebAssembly happens to be a really good option uh, to ensure that. Um, Jill, I, I, mm -hmm. there was a when you were talking about dependency isolation, I don't know if it was just me, but we lost maybe 10 seconds of audio. Uh, I don't know. If uh, um, if, okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just, if there's the intro piece of it, maybe, and then as a que I do have a question about the smart contracts bit. Can you? Is it yeah. possible for you to expand a bit on that? Because you know, let's say it's a smart contract. Like, w in what context? I guess are we yeah. talking about smart contracts? You know. Yeah. So various blockchains, you know, I know Ethereum has its own sort of uh, language for this. Uh, and maybe I should have put that on the, the earlier yeah, like slide. One of the things like the identity yeah. solidity yeah. in your previous. Right. Slide, so wasn't, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I, I'm first of all, let me just say I'm not an expert I, on the crypto space at all. I, I, like I haven't, I don't own any crypto. I don't. It, it's just not something that I'm particularly interested in. I do know that there are some blockchains out there, which I, uh, the names are escaping me, that actually do use WebAssembly as the mechanism for smart, smart contracts. Uh, so I know that is a thing. I, I, I don't know how high profile they are. Um, right. But right. It, so it, it could be something yeah. like it could be a, basically an alternate blockchain that's using WebAssembly underneath essentially for their 
um, smart contracts. Okay. Exactly. I do know of one that's actually using Java for that purpose, which I don't think is actually a great idea uh, for a variety of reasons. But um, but yeah, I think WebAssembly, it was designed for that sort of isolation and uh, and sandboxing. So uh, if, you know, it, uh, there's probably good reasons why, you know, so, uh, you know uh, various blockchains have invented their own. Uh, and I, I wouldn't pretend to, to know the, the reasons behind it, but WebAssembly is is a good option. And then all I was saying about dependency isolation was that uh, if you have an application that depends on transitively or directly on a variety of other third-party projects, as much as possible, WebAssembly would like to uh, would give you the opportunity to isolate those dependencies so they don't have access to all of your application state and and the network and the file system, even if your application as a whole does have access to those things. Uh, so uh, the example I was giving was being able to base 64 encode uh, a string, the dependency should only have access to that string. It should not be able to do network calls. It should not be able to access the file system. It should not be able to access the, re the remainder of the state of your application, which can be tricky to achieve uh, without, uh, without some form of, of fine-grained sandbox. Boxing. Just one question on the on the IoT bit. Uh, when mm -hmm. you say IoT, are you talking about the ability to leverage WebAssembly at some level um, as a more efficient way of um, of, a, of execution on a low compute IoT device? Is that what you're referring to? <laughs> yeah, it's not necessarily more efficient uh, co compared to native code. Like if you're targeting a microcontroller or something like that, it probably won't be more efficient necessarily. The intention though is but that- say relative to Python, right? Like say- Yeah, do, for yeah, sure, for yeah. sure. Def definitely more efficient than that. Uh, the, the main intention here is that uh, any given IoT application will probably have some low level code that's responsible for the correct operation of the device and some higher level code, which might be responsible for um, uh, providing a user interface or something that may not be as performant or, uh, performance critical or safety critical. Um, you know, the, uh, an automotive uh, application might be, you know, uh, something, you know, the, the, the being able to browse radio stations versus controlling fuel injection and whatnot, right? There's, there's two different levels that, you know, whereas you want to be able to separate those from each other and fine grain isolation is one of the ways you can do that. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So uh, when we talk about running WebAssembly outside of the browser, one of the key pieces is some sort of interface to the system. Uh, most applications are going to need more than just being able to execute instructions and uh, uh, you know, and use memory, which is really all you get by default in WebAssembly. So, uh, and in the browser, there are interfaces to access the DOM and, uh, you know, the do network requests and whatnot uh, that are pretty standard. But uh, uh, when you're running in a non-browser context, you need some way of interact, some standard way of interacting with the file system, interacting with the network, uh, in getting random numbers, clocks, all, st all pretty much standard expected operating system functionality. And so WASI is that interface, or at least it's one of them. Uh, you may have heard of MScript in, uh, is another option, but again, that's more targeted towards the browser and essentially being able to run desktop applications unchanged in the browser, whereas WASI is really about running you know, cloud or desktop applications in the cloud or the desktop. Uh, and so uh, traditionally, that's been essentially a, a mirror of POSIX, or at least the good parts of POSIX, which is the sort of Unix standard for uh, accessing these, these resources. Um, uh, as we'll see in a moment, there are uh, the the scope of WASI is expanding over time to include higher level interfaces for doing HTTP calls, RPC, et cetera. Uh, but the last thing I'll note here is there are several implementations of standalone WebAssembly runtimes. By standalone, I mean outside of the browser, uh, which provide WASI built in, including WASM time, Node.js, WASMer, uh, and there are others that I haven't listed here. Uh, we at Fermion tend to focus on WASM time, and that's what we contribute to upstream. 
Uh, but as I said earlier, the uh, the scope of WASI is growing over time and it's becoming more modular. Uh, some of the additional features that we're exposing uh, are HTTP and RPC. And you might wonder, well, if you know if you can access the network already in WASI, you know, at the TCP or UDP level, why do you need HTTP uh, in, as well? And the idea here is that higher level interfaces give the host more opportunities to sort of optimize maybe doing connection pooling and so on uh, than a lower level interface where it's less clear to the host what the guest is actually trying to accomplish. And so, uh, you know, higher, sometimes a higher level interface uh, has benefits. Um, other, other examples are key value and blob storage, SQL, messaging, uh, queuing, uh, distributed locks, all, all sorts of things that are you might think of as the building blocks for modern microservices and cloud-based applications. So all these things are being worked on, standardized, and uh, will, will be coming soon. Uh, some in-progress proposals are uh, more related to the lower level workings of WebAssembly uh, that are coming down the pipeline. One thing that I've been working on uh, lately is the component model, which is a way to, uh, a standard way to compose web chunks of WebAssembly code. Uh, so currently, when we talk about com composition in the context of WebAssembly, we're, we're kind of talking about one of, of two things. You could, you could have multiple WebAssembly pieces of code that have, you know, if they're running in the browser, they could have a Java, some JavaScript code that sort of proxies calls between them. You can set that up. Um, you can, uh, if you're using WASI, you could have them connected via some sort of RPC mechanism. Um, and then you can also do composition sort of at, at compile time where you're building an application and then you're composing some, li uh, say, if you're writing a Rust application, you're you pulling down a Rust library or several Rust libraries, linking them all together into a single WASM blob. The goal with web, you know, true WebAssembly composition is that you wouldn't have to do any of those things. You can still do those things. But in addition, you would be able to deploy a reusable chunk of WebAssembly code and compose that with other WebAssembly code, uh, either at build time or deploy time or just before, just prior to runtime uh, in a way that's analogous to dynamic libraries like DLLs or .SOs uh, in the native world. Uh, and the part of the goal here, the ambition is to actually do better than that and actually have a more expressive ABI than what you get in the native world, which is basically the C ABI, which is just passing pointers around. Uh, we're trying to, uh, with the component model, build something that allows you to uh, pass around higher level data, kind of what you're used to with, say, gRPC, where you can pass you know, lists and uh, structures, records, variants, that sort of thing, uh, higher level application uh, uh, data. Um, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because we're, you know, I, as I expected, we're running out of time here. But uh, uh, part, of, part of that vision is to have a registry, a federated registry uh, with, uh, you know, if you're, you've heard of certificate transparency in the context of uh, TLS, similar th uh, thing we're trying to achieve. Uh, I don't want to call it blockchain, but it's kind of similar. It's creating sort of a Merkle tree of uh, basically uh, publishing and in some cases yanking banking packages, again, trying to address the concerns around supply chain security uh, by, you know, uh, essentially signing packages and uh, and creating a public ledger of, uh, of packages similar to what we do for uh, certificate transparency. Uh, and then asynchronous futures and streams. You can also already do these things in a way in WebAssembly, but composing two pieces of WebAssembly together that both try to do asynchronous network operations, uh, it, the story there is not great. And so we're working to improve that. Uh, and then stack switching, I won't go into that too much. Uh, you can look it up. Uh, it's one of the, the official proposals. Uh, but uh, hardware fault isolation, I did want to spend a little bit of time on because it kind of comes back to what we saw in an earlier slide where we had an 87x overhead over, you know, by adding fine grained isolation via WebAssembly versus a native call with no isolation. And the intention between behind hardware fault, uh, fault oscillation, isolation, excuse me, um, which I have a, a link to the paper that's proposing this uh, at the at the end here, 
is that uh, we would extend the uh, x86 and ARM and other and RISC, RISC, RISC-V ISAs, hardware ISAs, so that the next generation of these processors would have built-in support for fine-grained isolation, so that you could, within a process, uh, in the case, in this case, a, a WebAssembly runtime or a web browser, be able to allocate some memory and then mark that memory as being the only memory which a subroutine which you're calling, uh, which might be calling into a WebAssembly guest, um, uh, has access to uh, versus the very coarse grained uh, uh, page table based uh, isolation that is currently used, which, as we saw, has some overhead, significant overhead. And the, the intention is that this could run in parallel. They, they actually created a simulation of a real x86 processor that does this, but it would run in parallel as part of the existing memory management machinery that's already baked into uh, these modern chips uh, to, to do that, that access checking uh, so that it would not add it, an additional stage to the processor pipeline and thus add no visible overhead uh, over a non-isolated case. And that's where I was saying, you know, there still might be in certain cases some context switching overhead, and that's why it might not ever be completely a 1x, you know, match to uh, to what you see in the native world with without isolation, but it would give it pretty darn close, which is really exciting. All right, so for the last half hour here or so, uh, well, first of all, I'll give you guys a chance if you have any more questions, uh, but the plan here is to build an app uh, a note-taking app from scratch using a few key technologies, uh, and uh, but be and I do have a link to the implementation here. I'll try to share that uh, in the appropriate venues after uh, after this session um, uh, for your reference. But we're going to build that app uh, pretty much from scratch, uh, run it, and uh, and you know if we have time, we'll we'll, we'll actually deploy it to a cloud-based service. Uh, where we can access it, where you know we can send links to people and and access it that way. Um, uh, but if we don't have time, there's the reference implementation. You you're free to to take a look at it at your leisure. But but first, any questions, comments, thoughts? You're good, Joe. All right. I mean, maybe just one quick thing. Uh, yeah. Are there any uh, differences in uh, mobile operating systems for uh, these browser-based systems? Because I know that uh, iOS is especially, it has more security over the resources. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I can't, I'm not an expert on this. I don't have any firsthand experience running WebAssembly on mobile devices, except in the context of a browser. Um, so I, you know, I do know that iOS, uh, uh, if if you're hosting WebAssembly in a native app on iOS, you're going to run into the issue from a performance standpoint that you cannot load uh, code that has ever been writable. Basically, you cannot generate just-in-time uh, compile code, essentially, which is what runtimes, uh, high performance runtimes like WASM time do, which is like the very first step is prior to running a WebAssembly module is to just in time compile it from WebAssembly code to native code. Uh, and so you would be limited to interpreters in that case. And if you wanted actual just in time uh, type of performance, you would actually need to invoke, you could still do it, you just have to use like a web view style approach where you're um, uh, hosting the browser and injecting the WebAssembly into the browser and having it do sort of the high performance WebAssembly interpretation. Um, again, I, I don't have direct experience doing that. Um, so I don't know if there are other gotchas, but that's, that's what I've heard. Oh, right, thanks. Cool. All right. Well, let's flip on over here to a terminal. Uh, and I'm going to go through this somewhat quickly just because I want to make sure that we can cover a lot of ground. Uh, but feel free to stop me uh, at any time if you have any questions or thoughts. Um, I did put a link into the Zoom chat uh, earlier to the completed version of this project, uh, which has actually additional bells and whistles we're not even going to try to add here. It does end-to-end -end encryption of notes and stuff, which is kind of fun, but uh, we're not going to try and do that right here. Uh, but it does have a list of prerequisites that you can download if you want to follow along here. 
Um, okay, so let's get started here. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, uh, let's see, what directory am I in here? I'm going to CD into my projects directory here. First thing we're going to do is we are going to use this spin app. So spin is something that my company Fermion has created. It's an open source project for quickly developing cloud-based, uh, what we like to call nano services or functions as a service. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, paste in here because I'm a slow typer. I'm going to do kind of cut and paste driven development here, uh, going to paste in a command to create a new project using spin called notes. And it's going to be based on this HTTP Rust uh, template. So we're going to write a little HTTP triggered function. Um, and that uh, right there, let's see, should be something that we can actually run. Let's see how it's got to build it. So a Rust-based app here. Okay, so it, we are running it. I'm going to go ahead and background that. And I'm going to curl. And we get a hello Fermion. That's the that's that's what you get by default if you don't edit the code. Uh, so what we're doing, what Spin is doing is it's just running a little web server on port 3000 and uh uh, and then you can make requests to it, and then it runs our code uh, that that was built as part of the template. And we can go ahead and look at that code really quick here. Uh, so it's it's pretty pretty simple, uh, some Rust code, um, and we can see it's building that. Requ uh, response to the request we made. It's also printing something out, uh, but not doing much yet. Uh, we're going to change that here in a moment. Um, but uh, uh, just just for reference here, we'll also load it up in the browser. Just make sure that we can escape out of here. Uh, Yeah. Okay. So we can see the same message in our browser here, and that'll be useful because we're actually going to build a web app that is more amenable to a browser than curl here in a moment. Uh, so we, at this point where we're at, we pretty quickly, we got something up and running. Uh, this is WebAssembly. So this is Rust compiling to WebAssembly and then uh, being embedded in spin uh, as an HTTP handler uh, and handling all incoming HTTP requests. Um, um, so, so we've got, we've got WebAssembly running in the cloud, so to speak. We, it's not actually in the cloud. It's on my laptop, uh, but we could deploy this to the cloud and it would work. And we'll do that later if we have time. Uh, so we got half of what we're trying to do here, but the other half is we want to run some WebAssembly in the client. And to do that, we're going to go back to our command line here. Let me, uh, Bring that app to the foreground, spin. Okay, we're gonna stop spin here while we do a little bit more coding. Uh, the next thing I wanna do here while I'm in my notes directory is I'm going to uh, create a new Rust project using the standard cargo new command. Cargo, if you're not familiar with it, is the build and packaging tool for Rust. Uh, and I'm going to create a new project, which is a, a project uh, which is a binary project. That's what, if you're running in the browser, you're creating a, a binary because uh, the browser expects to call into the uh, what's called the start function, which is the main function, uh, similar to what a command line app uh, would execute. Uh, and it did give us a little warning here. We'll address that here in just a sec. Uh, just, this just has to do with... Uh, nesting one Rust project in another, and uh, we're going to tell it that they're actually unrelated despite one being a subdirectory of the other. Uh, and I just edited the cargo toml for that. Not super interesting. Um, uh, the other thing I want to take a look at here, though, is uh, this, there's another file that I actually meant to look at a moment ago, which is spin.toml. That was generated uh, automatically as part of that spin new command earlier. And this essentially defines our uh, what our application looks like from the point of view of the spin host that's going to run it. And it tells, uh, for example, which routes uh, HTTP URIs, in other words, should be forwarded to this component. We could, by default, we just have one component here. We could have multiple WebAssembly components in here, uh, including ones we could specify by URL, which we didn't even write, you know, that we just got off, you know, somebody else wrote and, and, and published. Um, 
Uh, and uh, this also tells uh, spin uh, when we do a spin build how to build it, which just runs the cargo build tool for us. Um, while we're in here, I'm going to add a couple things. One is an additional directive which tells spin that, uh, so by default, uh, uh, your application will have no access to the file system and no access to the, the network. Um, and so if you want your application to have those things, you have to tell spin explicitly. And again, this goes back to the, the uh, sandbox model of WebAssembly and the, uh, the idea that we're not gonna try and guess what privileges an application should have, uh, you, we need to be explicit about what those are. And so similar to like a container or a virtual machine, we can have what's called uh, file system mounts. And that's what we're doing here. We're doing a file system mount of the local client disk directory, which we're gonna create in a moment that will contain our client side, HTML and uh, WebAssembly code. Uh, and we're gonna mount that at the root of the file system that the guest sees. So we did that, we saved our code, um, let's see. And then I'm gonna go back to the command line here and I'm going to um, touch client. I'm gonna create, uh, we're gonna use a tool called trunk here in a moment, which allows us to uh, easily build WebAssembly based Rust apps. Um, uh, and in order for it to work, it needs to have an index.html. It needs to just exist there. We're going to create an empty one. It'll fill in the details, for instance, links to the JavaScript loader code and the WebAssembly code that we're building. Um, uh, in this case, we don't have any particular configuration to add, so just an empty file will, will suffice, but it at least needs to be there uh, in order for Trunk to do its thing. Um, and then uh, I am going to add one more thing to our server side app, which is Mime Guess, which is a third party project, which just is useful for translating file name, uh, file names and particular file name extensions to Mime types, uh, which we'll use in just a moment when we edit our application. So right now we're just we've just essentially got a hello world. I'm going to go ahead and delete that, and we're going to put something else in here. And again, I'm just going to kind of cut and paste this into place. And I'll explain what I just put in here. So now I'm actually looking at the request before I just sort of ignored the request and just uh, sent a response back. Now I'm uh, actually looking at this request and I'm going to, I've got essentially a default Git handler, which says for any path, if we can find a, a file in the file system. So it's, it's basically a simple file server. Uh, if we can find a, a file in the file system, we're gonna load that up, find the MIME type for it based on its extension and return it. And then if we can't find uh, something for that path, then we're going to load up index.html, which we're going to create in a moment here. Uh, so actually in, in real life, I might actually use uh, the uh, spin actually has, the spin SDK has a router that, uh, that you can use to kind of simplify this code. I'm kind of do it from scratch more for, uh, you know, pedagogical uh, purposes, uh, but there are simpler options. Uh, we'll, we'll just go with this one for now. Um, and then I'm going to back at the command line, CD into client, and I'm gonna run another cargo add, adding a third party dependency. This one is called Leptos, which is uh, your, probably heard, you know, in the JavaScript ecosystem, you've got uh, React and Vue and SolidJS and others. There's a million of them, uh, you know, front end frameworks out there. Uh, uh, in Rust world, there's also about a million of them. Uh, Leptos isn't even one of the most popular ones. Uh, it's one of the newer ones. Uh, if you're familiar with SolidJS, it's inspired by that sort of architecture and thus very performant. Um, uh, that's the one I chose to use today. So we're just gonna roll with that. And then over in our main, our client code, we've got main.rs by default, it's not doing much. It's just printing hello world. We're not gonna stop there. We want something a little more sophisticated here. Uh, I'm actually gonna delete this whole thing. I'm gonna paste something in here. Um, we are going to, Add a 
bunch of code here. Do, 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 do. Just a moment. Okay, I just pasted something else in here and I'll go through it. Uh, don't be too intimidated here. Um, actually, did I skip something here? Just one moment, sorry. Oh yeah, I, I skipped a step, but it's it's okay. We'll we'll come back to it. Uh, there's a couple other dependencies I'm, I haven't added to the project yet, but we'll do that in a moment. Um, uh, we saw Leptos earlier. I'm also importing something that has to do with the async machinery in uh, in Rust. Won't spend too much time on that. And then there's this little library called Requasm, which is uh, a thin layer on top of the Fetch API for the browser so that we can do HTTP calls in somewhat idiomatic Rust. Uh, and so uh, this is actually the core of the my, our simple application, our Notes app, which is a, a function that takes this, this Leptos context called a scope and returns some dynamically updatable HTML uh, in the form of this impl into view. view. I'm not going to go into the Rustisms here, but uh, if you're not familiar with Rust, you can kind of look some of this stuff up if you want to learn more. Uh, but essentially what we want to start with is we're going to declare some local variables, which uh, first of all, we want to find the origin where this web app was loaded from, which we'll use to make calls back up to the server uh, asynchronously later on. Uh, and then we're going to uh, uh, declare a reference to a piece of HTML, which we're going to define later on, uh, and also some content that we're going to fill into that dynamic HTML. And then we are going to do a quick, uh, essentially this is a fetch call. It's a little bit verbose because of kind of how we have to interact with the browser from Rust. Uh, but essentially we're doing a, an outgoing get request to get the notes that are already stored on the server. Uh, and we do that. And then uh, once we get that, we, we call notes.set, which will uh, uh, dynamically update our HTML uh, and fill in uh, so, so the user can see the notes. And then we're going to declare a function called save, which allows us to do the opposite. Instead of downloading notes, this will upload the notes uh, when we've edited them. Uh, and again, pretty straightforward. The main thing is we're posting uh, those notes uh, to the origin server uh, as the body. And uh, we do a little error handling so that if something does go wrong, we can tell the user. And then finally, we've got uh, something similar to if you're familiar with React's JSX or pretty much any modern framework. Let's do embed Rust code. I'm sorry, uh, HT, uh, HTML code and or CSS inside your your imperative code, and that's what we're doing here. Uh, so we have a very simple app. Uh, we've got a text area that is going to be populated with some dynamic content, which we refer to here. Uh, we've got a button that allows us to invoke the save function we declared above. And then we've got a little div here at the bottom to display an error if we do get uh, an error. And then finally, our main function is, is dead simple. It's just saying, telling Leptos to take the, call this function, uh, uh, inject it, the dynamic HTML into the actual web page's DOM and, uh, and continue to update it as, uh, as needed as content changes. Any questions about what's going on here? Cool. All right. So let's go back to the command line there. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there are a few things that I actually have not yet, in addition to, uh, have not yet installed. In addition to Leptos, we need a few other libraries here. Um, so we're going to add those libraries in. Uh, the, the foremost among them is that Requasm uh, thing for accessing the browser's networking or HTTP uh, uh, stack, and uh, a couple other things that allows us to access uh, DOM uh, uh, objects such as text areas and that sort of thing. All right, so we got that. And if all went well, we should be able to build that. Oh, oops. One more, one other thing. Uh, back in our spin toml, uh, we actually need to do more than just build the server code. We actually need to build the client code. Uh, 
And this is how we tell it to do that. So now we'll first build the client code and then build the server code. And I probably have missed a step here. So we'll, we'll see, we'll deal with it if, as necessary. And then this is the experience all Rust developers get is to watch things compile, maybe go off and get a coffee or whatever. Shouldn't take too long in this case. Oh, wow, it worked the first time, great. Okay, uh, so now we have spin running uh, again, and this time let's go back here, let's reload this page. Nothing has changed, what did I do wrong? Oh, it's still printing that, oh, maybe I didn't save something. One moment, please. There, I, indeed I did not. Let's go back here, reload. Hmm. This is not what I had hoped to see. Let's see. more tools. Do, do, do. Hmm. Let's go back and let's do a little debugging. Maybe I didn't save the other file either. Wouldn't put it past me. Indeed, I did not. No wonder it built the first time. Well, it's still built, so let's, let's see how we're doing. It's uh, it's always high pressure, Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trying to do this yeah. live. That's right. All right. I actually don't know why this HTML is popping up in here. That's kind of interesting. That This is, for reference, the HTML that Trunk builds for us. It will synthesize some JavaScript, uh, which is kind of interesting if you want to take a look at it at some point. Let's, let's actually take a look at that, because I think it might be... Uh, yeah, so this is the JavaScript. If you're curious about how WebAssembly is loaded in the browser, this is actually kind of fun to look at. Um, it actually will, let's see, um, it does a bunch of stuff, but the, I think the rubber meets the road somewhere. Oh yeah, so it, it's creating a memory. So it has to allocate some memory as a uint8 array, and that will be the memory that the WebAssembly sees. And then somewhere down here, Actually, there's more to it than, okay. Well, we won't spend a lot of time here. I, th I didn't realize there was so much to it. Then, it, oh, and then we've got this, this bind gen. So it has to create bindings so that we can call back and forth between JavaScript and uh, Rust code uh, in the WebAssembly guest. Uh, but uh, we won't spend a lot of time on that uh, here, uh, it, but it is interesting. Uh, it's somewhat readable if you wanna take a look at it on your own time. Okay, so let's see here. I'm just gonna make some very important notes here. And then I'm going to save, and and I got a 400. Goodness gracious! Okay, bad request. Oh yeah, that's that actually makes sense because we didn't finish our app. Live coding, I love it. Okay, so back in lib.rs again. All, so the only thing the request handler does is look for static content and deliver it, uh, and then it gives a bad request for everything else. So that's not all we want it to do. Um, let's see, do I have, yes, I missed this part earlier. Let's paste it in. We're going to handle a couple of the cases here. Oops. Let's go. Okay. <clears throat> so a couple of new endpoints here, uh, we can get now get and post to the notes endpoint. Uh, and this is going to be critical for uh, persisting our notes on the server side. Uh, one of the features that Spin has and that Fermion Cloud has when you deploy to the cloud is a built-in key value storage. Uh, and uh, quite convenient. We don't have to set up like authentication or you know uh, URLs and whatnot if we don't want to. You can also have point it at a Redis environment if you do want that. But uh, built-in is often easier, certainly for quick one-off things like this. Uh, and so what we're doing here is we're opening the default store, we're uh, getting the notes uh, based on that notes key, uh, and then we're returning it in the response. And then for a post, we do the opposite. We set the notes based on the request body. Let's go ahead and save that. And I think I actually need to uh, do one more thing here, which is 
bring this into scope. Okay, looking good. Kill this one more time, run it again, back to the browser. Let's reload. I don't think we needed to reload. Access denied, goodness gracious. Oh, I, I think I know. Wait, is that a real thing? Let's see. Maybe it was. Okay, let's take a look again. I probably didn't save the file, did I? No, I did. No, after the key value store in it. Yes. Is there a... Hit notes. No, still not happy. Interesting. It's not giving us a 500. It's not throwing an error. Git post. We're in the source directory. I returned an error, access denied. Oh, I do know. Okay, yes, I got this. This is a uh, spin toml. Forgot to add one more thing to the spin toml. So again, recall it's, uh, this can be kind of tricky with WebAssembly. Uh, the, the golden rule here is WebAssembly code, guest code does not have access to anything you do not give it explicit access to. And key value stores are one of them. So here we need to actually give access to the key value, default key value store. So let's do that. I should actually follow my notes. That would actually make this smoother, but it's a good lesson in isolation, I suppose. Okay, so we're running again. Go back to the browser, reload. Okay, we're looking good now. Okay, secret notes, save that. This time, we don't give any feedback right now. That would be a good addition. Uh, but we can reload the page, and secret notes are still there. We could open a private window, which shares no local state, and we could go to localhost 3000, and we still have our notes there. So they're, they're persisted on the server. If I went to another device on my phone or whatnot, they would be available. Um, and so what, what we've achieved there is now we have WebAssembly running on the server, which happens to be my laptop, and we have WebAssembly running in the browser, and we can actually share code between them. And if you look at the full example that I'll link to, um, it does... A, uh, it uses some other third-party libraries to do end-to-end uh, -end encryption and signing so that not just anybody can push new notes, updates to the notes uh, to the server, but only uh, signed copies of those notes will be accepted. Um, so that's a kind of a cool addition you can check out. Um, let me see here. Oh, yeah, we're just about out of time here. Um, so I think we can wrap that up. I, I'll, I'll just mention, and this this is mentioned in the, the project on GitHub, but you can push this for free to Fermion Cloud using your GitHub account. You don't even have to sign up for anything or, or anything like that. Uh, just use uh, OAuth authentication via GitHub, and you can push uh, this app or any other app you might want to create uh, to the cloud and share it with your friends. And I will wrap it up then. Any any questions, comments? No, just um, if maybe a minute if we can, um, Joel, on, on Fermion itself and like maybe what some of the offerings are that we can use off of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so Fermion is still pretty early stage uh, as a startup. Um, uh, we do have Fermion Cloud. That's our main product. Uh, we don't yet actually charge for it. There's only a free tier. We're working hard to get to the point where we <clears throat> can expand some into some paid offerings, including custom domains, <clears throat> um, geographic distribution, uh, and uh, additional uh, kind of uh, uh, higher limits in terms of bandwidth usage and, and so on. Uh, but Fermion Cloud, you can 
can use it today. Uh, it's essentially a serverless platform. If you're familiar with uh, uh, AWS Lambda, uh, similar, and we also have built-in key value storage with SQL storage coming soon. You can also use third party. So you could use Redis Labs to do uh, you know, uh, persistent storage in the cloud, or if you have your own already set up GCP or Azure based uh, database, you can use that as well. Um, and so we're, we're working on creating a pretty full featured platform as a service, uh, still early days, uh, but definitely would encourage people to check it out. Uh, it's a great way to get started with WebAssembly. Uh, you can also use Spin and host Spin uh, on your own infrastructure if you prefer. Uh, we have examples of using it in Kubernetes uh, and so on uh, as a way to kind of dip your toes in cloud-based WebAssembly uh, using familiar tools. Uh, so that's kind of what Fermion is all about at this point. Just a quick follow-up. Is it uh, the underlying infrastructure? Is it bare metal or are you running on top of another cloud it's, service? Yeah. yeah, it's on AWS right now. We're going to, our uh, priority is to go multi-cloud pretty soon <clears throat> uh, and and become more geographically distributed. Uh, right now, it's only pretty US-based, uh, but uh, we want to kind of get in. I mentioned edge computing earlier. We want to uh, be able to get that code running close to each user's uh, location. Uh, so that's a priority. Got it, got it. All right, cool. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate the time. As always, this was great. I'm going to uh, uh, stop the recording now. And um, you know, if uh, if folks have any questions, anything that uh, that needs to be followed up with Joel on, we can do that offline. But thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for joining as well. Mm -hmm.